And so we're going to read the whole chapter, but the sermon is going to focus on verses 1 through 13. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the remainder of the chapter. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you now, because it's a hard text, I'm going to spend some time just laying groundwork. I'm going to spend time explaining some things so that when we begin the sermon and begin the application, it'll make more sense to us. And so even as we read it, I just want to ask you to pray. Pray and ask the Lord for understanding and wisdom so that as we begin to pick it apart, he would use it to encourage us and edify us. Because brothers and sisters, the word was given to us to encourage us and edify us. It's not a puzzle. It's not a mystery. It's not a code that needs to be cracked. God gave it to us and then he gives us a spirit so we can understand it. And so with all of that said, I want to invite you, if you are able one more time, please stand to honor the reading of God's holy inspired and inerrant word. And hear the word of the Lord. I'm going to read the whole chapter, Mark 13. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infant in those days... Pray that it may not happen in winter, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if someone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven on earth, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake, 
for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. As, and what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to pray one more time for us. Father, we thank you again for your word. Thank you for the privilege that we can gather here and listen to it. We ask now again that your spirit would give clarity, would give understanding, and Lord, that you would use this word to encourage, edify, build up, nourish our souls. And Lord, would you use it to fix our eyes on your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. In the movie, Back to the Future 2, the main villain's name is Biff. Biff. And Biff, he goes back in time to find his younger self, and he gives his younger self a book. And that book had the winner of every major sporting event from the year 1950 to the year 2000. Now, why would Biff give his younger self a book like that? Well, if you've seen the movie, you already know why. He, he gave that book to his younger self so that he could bet on all the teams that win and become rich. He was looking out for himself in the future. He, he gave his younger self knowledge of the future so that he would change how he lived in his present. When we think about this, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If we had any kind of knowledge of the future, it would no doubt change how we live our lives today. It would affect how we make decisions now. You see, the Lord, He didn't give us information about the future in His Word so that we can put together charts and, and tables and try to predict, uh, predict specific events and try to figure out when things are going to happen. That's not why He gave us information about the future. No, the Lord gave us information about the future so that we can be faithful and live God-honoring lives now in our present. And we see this very clearly in Mark chapter 13. When Jesus and his disciples are coming out of the temple, his disciples, they ask Jesus a question about the future. And in his response, what does Jesus do? He gives them a boatload of commands. We see in this chapter a lot, lots and lots of imperatives. Verse 5, see that no one leads you astray. Do not be ashamed. Be on your guard. Do not be anxious. Say whatever is given to you in that hour. Verse 21, do not believe it. Verse 23 again, be on guard. Verse 33, be on guard. Keep awake. Verse 35, stay awake. 35 and 37, stay awake. That is a lot of commands for one chapter. Lots of imperatives we see here. And here's the thing, though Jesus was speaking to his disciples in that moment in time, God the Holy Spirit inspired Mark to document this teaching so that we too can be encouraged to live faithful lives as we look to the future as well. Now before we begin looking at how this text encourages us to be faithful to the Lord, we need to clarify two things. There's two things that I want us to kind of look at so that we will better understand the whole chapter. First, we need to understand the questions that the disciples asked Jesus. And then second, I want us to see the flow and structure of the chapter. So let's look at the questions. When Jesus and his disciples were leaving the temple, one of the disciples, Mark doesn't tell us who, some think it was Judas, we don't know for sure, he turns and he, and he looks to Jesus and says, wow, 
this place is beautiful. How beautiful and how wonderful these buildings are. And he was not exaggerating. The temple was known to be gorgeous. It was massive. Historians wrote about the temple being built with gold. There was gold in the columns. There was gold on the walls. When the sun hit it just right, it would leave you blind. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous structure. It said that multiple football fields could fit inside the temple. This is how big the complex was. And so it would have been impressive for anyone to look at. He wasn't exaggerating. But in response to this unnamed disciple, what does Jesus do? He predicts that the temple will one day be destroyed. And so as they're leaving the temple, they go down into the valley and they come up on the other side on the Mount of Olives. And then we see that Peter, James, John, and Andrew they asked Jesus about when is that going to happen? When is this going to happen? Mark writes their question this way, verse 4. Tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And so when we read this, what does it seem like they're asking? It seems like they're asking about when the temple is going to be destroyed. And they want to know signs so that they can figure out when it's going to happen. When is this going to happen? What are some signs that are going to give us a heads up? And here's the thing. They are asking about the destruction of the temple. But they did not just ask about the destruction of the temple. If we turn to Matthew chapter 24 verse 3. We see in Matthew's account of this, the Olivet Discourse, that the disciples asked Jesus something else on that day. In Matthew 24, 3, it reads like this. Tell us when these things will be, referring to the destruction of the temple, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age. So Matthew, in his gospel, writes explicitly what Mark and Luke leave implicit. You see, the temple was so important to Jewish life, to, to, to their religion, right? What, what they were practicing, what they understood to be the old covenant and keeping of that. It was so important and so central that in the minds of most people living at that time, the destruction of the temple could only mean one thing, the end of the world. If the temple were to be destroyed, then that can only mean the end of the age. This is why here in Mark we read in Jesus' response that he doesn't just seem to talk about the destruction of the temple. What does he talk about? He talks about the end of the age. He talks about when Christ is going to return. Even though here it doesn't seem like the disciples asked about that because of the way Mark wrote it, we know from Matthew that they did. They were asking about the destruction of the temple and also about the end of the age. And in case you didn't notice, the disciples understood that when Jesus was returning, when he returns, that meant the end of this age. They were right. They had a right understanding of that. When the Messiah comes again to rescue his people, the second advent, the first advent was the birth of Christ. The second advent, when Christ returns to rescue his people, that concludes this age. And it kicks off the age to come. The age when Christ will reign on this earth with his people forever and ever. They had a right understanding of it. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9, we read that the death of Jesus on the cross actually marks the beginning of this final age. We are in this final age now. We see in Matthew 16 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that when Jesus returns, it's the end of this age. So it started with his death on the cross and it ends when Christ returns. This is why we also see, if you look again in chapter 13, verse 37, that Jesus said, what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. He's talking to his disciples who are there with him, but he's also talking to who? To all believers. This is meant to encourage every Christian who is going to live during this age, from the moment when Christ was born until Christ returns. The age is that whole span of time. And Jesus said these things so that all of them, all of us, would be encouraged and so that all of us would stay awake. 
And so that understanding of what's happening here, what encompasses the age, will help us better understand this text. The age that we're talking about here, it's from Jesus' death and before his death, his life, his death, up until when he returns. Now next, I want us to see the flow and structure of the text. This is important. This will help us. And here's why I think it's, it's important and why it will help us. One, there are many godly pastors and theologians who interpret this chapter differently. Men who are much more smarter than me, who I have lots of respect for. So I just want you guys to know my view and my approach to it. That's one. But two, this is a hard text to understand. And so, me telling you on the front end, the flow and structure of it hopefully will help you and help me study it better together. And so, this is how the text flows. If you take notes, hopefully you can keep along. Uh, you can always reference the video afterwards. If you want this, I can email it to you. Feel free. But this is how we're going to break it down. Verses 1 through 4, we see the questions of the disciples. These questions develop. They're the parameters for the whole chapter. The questions were, as we know, about what? The destruction of the temple and when will Jesus return? That's what this chapter is answering, those two things. And then verses 5 through 23, that big block of scripture. Jesus there is talking about the different tribulations and trials that are going to plague this age. Another way we can say it is that all the things that we're reading in verses 5 through 23 will happen between his first advent when he was born and his second advent when he returns. And then how does he refer to these things? Jesus calls them what? Birth pangs. He says that these are birth pangs. These are the signs that are leading up to a new and beautiful life, which is what? That's exactly what happens when Jesus returns. When Jesus returns, he will make all things new. And so the trials and tribulations of this age, Jesus refers to them as birth pangs. But then in verses 14 through 19, he zooms in and he talks about a specific birth pang. He talks about a specific tribulation. And there in 14 to 19, he's responding to the question about the temple. And so verses 14 through 19 is specifically about the siege on Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, which happened between 66 AD and 70 AD after the death of Christ. And we're going to look at that more closely next week, Lord willing. Verses 24 through 27, there we read about the return of Christ, which happens after what we see in 5 through 23. So he describes the, the birth pangs of the age, and then in, in verses 24 through 27, he says, and after that time, after that tribulation, the Son of Man's going to return. Verses 28 through 31, we read about the fig tree. This is a reflection on the tribulations of this age. This is a reflection on verses 5 through 23. And we'll look at this again next week as well. But the point of this was to let his disciples know once these things happen, which will happen within your generation, nothing else needs to happen for the return of Christ. There's nothing else to look forward to or wait for. And then lastly, in verses 32 through 37, we see a parable. And the parable is meant to encourage us, all of us, to stay awake, to stay awake and to remain faithful to Christ until he returns. So I know that was a lot of explanation, that was a lot of groundwork, but, but I, I do believe this will help us understand the text better. So all of that said, how does this encourage us to live faithful lives? Well, first, we see that we are to be faithful by avoiding false teachers. We are to be faithful to the Lord, and one way we do that is by avoiding false teachers. When Jesus begins to answer the disciples' questions, the first thing that he says is what? Verses 5 and 6. See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. This is what he starts with. And Jesus is so concerned about his followers sticking to the word of God. He's so concerned about them not being deceived that he doesn't start with this. He ends with it. Notice he mentions it again in verses 21 and 22. He brackets this whole section with this. Do not be led astray. 
People are going to come claiming that I am the Christ. They're going to say, I am the Christ. They're going to act like they're me. Like, like I've come back. Don't believe it. He wanted his disciples to know, and he wants us, all of his followers, every Christian who lives in this age, he wants us to know that people will arise and claim to be Jesus or to be some type of prophet or some type of, of new voice and new revelation. And we see examples of this in the Bible. Acts chapter 5, we read about two men who sh shortly before Jesus came on the scene, they led many people astray. And if you look into Josephus, a historian, a Jewish historian, he writes about many false prophets and, and men who arose after Jesus claiming to be the Christ. And what did they do? They led many people astray. In 44 AD, after the death of Christ, he writes specifically about one named Theodos because apparently he led many followers of Christ towards false doctrine and error. This is something that we are going to see. Jesus was telling his disciples, and it's for our instruction, you will see men and women arise and claim to be prophets or even the Christ himself throughout this age. Until I return, expect to see that. And Jesus mentions it. Why? Because it's a legitimate threat to his church. It's a legitimate threat to his followers. Now, I'm fairly certain that some of you are probably thinking, listen, Chris, if some dude comes to, to grace or, or to my block and says, I am Jesus, I'm the Messiah, I'm going to think he's crazy. I'm not going to be tempted to follow him. I'm going to call the cops. You, you may think that this is not a legitimate temptation for you, that this isn't something that would tempt us if someone were claiming to be a Christ or someone were to be a false prophet. And I pray that is the case. I pray we aren't tempted to follow him. Don't get me wrong. But brothers and sisters, we need to recognize something. The reality is, in the face of tribulation, in the face of trials, in the midst of pain and suffering which we all go through, in those times, we can find ourselves desperate to hear someone say exactly what we want to hear. Jesus, I believe, he starts and ends this section talking about this, warning his followers to beware of, of false prophets and, and false messiahs and false teachers because Jesus knew in this age you are going to encounter tribulation and persecution. You will encounter famine. You're going to see things go crazy. Things are not going to make sense. You're going to be hurt. You're going to suffer. And when you're suffering, if someone comes along and says, I have the answers, you may be tempted to follow him. If someone comes along and says, don't worry, it's going to be fine. Here's why. Come follow me. You may be tempted to do it. And so he's warning his people. He's warning us, don't fall in the trap. Don't fall in the trap. Be on guard. And so we need to guard our doctrine. We need to guard what we are reading. We need to pay attention to the sermons we are listening to. We should not willingly expose ourselves to teachings and preachings and sermons of people that we know do not preach the Word of God. We need to be like the Bereans. If we hear something and, and we just want to be sure, we check it for ourselves. And what do we check it with? The Word of God. This is the standard. We don't simply want to hear what we, well, no, we do, but we should not simply seek to hear what we want to hear. We want to make sure that any teaching, any book, any study that we are going through is in alignment with the Word of God. And let me go ahead and say something to you all. If some of you are here and you are wrestling with sin, if, if you know that there's sin in your heart, there's sin in your life that you are hiding, that you are avoiding, you want to confess it, you want to bring it to the light, but, but you're too nervous or you're too scared, let me tell you something. You especially, first repent. Please repent of your sin. Turn to Christ. But in addition to that, you really need to be wary because there are many pastors and preachers and, and self-proclaimed prophets out there who love to justify sin. They are experts in telling people, what you're doing isn't wrong. You don't need to repent. What you're doing isn't wrong. You can keep living how you're living. And what does that lead to? It leads to hell. It leads to condemnation. This is, this is why there are so many out there, because they are willing to say what people want to hear. 
And so if you have some type of, of sin in your life, I just want to encourage you, repent. Bring it to the Lord. Know that he is faithful and just to forgive you. He's ready to receive you. Don't run from him and look for someone to justify it. No, go to the Lord. Run to the one who can forgive you and who loves you. But beware. We need to take this seriously. It was given to us because it's a legitimate threat. Next, we are to be faithful in the midst of wars and disasters. We are to be faithful in the midst of wars and disasters. And really, another way we can look at this is, we are to be faithful when it looks like everything is going crazy in this world. In verses 5 through 8, Jesus tells his disciples that they are going to hear of wars, of rumors of wars, of nations conquering nations. They're going to hear of earthquakes. They're going to hear about famines. And he tells them, these things need to happen. But what? The end is not yet. We don't know why they need to happen. He doesn't say in his word, but because we know this is the word of God and we trust him, we believe him. We know he knows what he's doing. And so he says these things need to happen. But what does he say after? The end is not yet. And how should we respond? What does he tell his disciples? Don't be alarmed. Do not be alarmed. Don't panic. Do you see this? Are you, do you, you see it with me, right? I'm not making this up. When you see the wars and the famines and the earthquakes and the craziness, don't panic. Don't be alarmed. That is like the exact opposite of what we see. We all know those people. You know those people who when there's an earthquake or there's a war or there's, there's something horrible that happens, their response is what? Ah! Jesus is coming. He'll be here tomorrow. They panic. They're alarmed. They, they see it as like immediately that means Christ must be coming at any moment. They, they see these big events and they interpret them in that way. Brothers and sisters, Jesus literally is saying the opposite. When you see these things, all of these things, these events, disasters and wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. These are but the birth pangs. Just like contractions when a woman's in labor, just like contractions mean that a baby's coming, but we all know what? It could be hours. It could be weeks. Well, likewise, when these things happen, when you see these things during this age, don't panic. Don't be alarmed. These are but birth pangs. In other words, there's more time that needs to pass. There's more that is to come. Don't fret. In the early church, they, they went through this. We know from Acts chapter 11 that there was a famine there in the region. And the believers, from what we can gather from the book of Acts, they responded how they should. They didn't panic. We read in Acts 11 that they gathered together. They took up an offering. They gave what they could. And they blessed the churches and the Christians that were suffering. They responded well. And again, Josephus, Jewish historian, there's a lot you can learn from him. His book on antiquities, his book named War, we read about these things. He, he explains during the reign of Caligula in 40 AD, there were rumors of wars. There were rumors that he was going to go to Jerusalem and try to take over the temple. So the disciples, they experienced these things. There were major earthquakes in 61 AD and 63 AD. Those were the earthquakes that took down Pompeii. This happened shortly after Jesus predicted all of these things. And as we know, I don't think anyone here needs to be convinced, don't we see these things happening still? We read this and it's like, well, this is characterizing our generation. And it's because it is. It's because it does. That's what Jesus is saying. These things will happen throughout the rest of the age until I return, until the Son of Man returns. And what does our kind and loving Savior tell us? When you see it, don't be alarmed. Don't panic. Stay focused and keep your eyes on me. These birth pangs will persist throughout the age. And Jesus calls all of his followers, including us today, to remain faithful in the midst of them. And remaining faithful here means what? That we aren't giving into fear, that we aren't giving into panic, that we aren't giving into anxiety, but that we continue to trust the Lord and we continue to obey him and we continue to serve him faithfully because we recognize that he is still in control.
We recognize that this doesn't need to scare us or alarm us because he said it would happen. He said it would happen. And so I just want to ask, how, and you don't need to answer, right? But how many of you do you, you know deep in your heart that this pandemic and, and the way it's affected you, it's leading you to doubt the Lord. It's leading you to doubt that he is good. It's leading you to question if he's really in control, if he knows what he's doing. Maybe it's led you to even question if he's real at all. Because your family may have been affected because you lost a loved one or maybe you lost a job or, or who knows what, but you're tired and you're hurting and you have COVID fatigue and it's led you to doubt. It's led you to panic, even if your panic isn't outward, even if your panic is inward. Be encouraged. The Lord is telling you today through his word, don't give up. Don't give in. By the grace that I give you, hold fast. Hold fast. I'm still in control. I told you in my word this was going to happen. This, it's all according to plan. Don't fret. Trust me. Be faithful. And maybe it's not the pandemic. I know many, many people are really struggling with our political climate in this country. It's very distressing. There's, there's lots of fear and doubt that come with it. Listen, again, this doesn't surprise the Lord. This, this isn't anything new to him. We cannot let these things, whether it's politics or wars or earthquakes, we can't let any of it, pandemics, nothing, take our eyes and focus off the Lord. We can't allow these things to put doubt into our hearts. This is one of the reasons why he told us about them so that when we see them, we can remember. He said this would happen. I can keep trusting him and I can remain faithful. We find solace in the fact that our Lord told us this is meant to encourage us. And what do we see in Matthew 28? What did Jesus tell his disciples when he told them to go forth to the nations and make disciples? He said, and behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Jesus knew that this time, until he returns for these 2,000 years and, and who knows how much longer, he knew they were going to be hard. He knew we were going to suffer, that there was going to be much tribulation. And so he tells his people, he tells you, if your faith is in Christ, listen, I'm with you. You're not alone. And he is, he's with us. We know that everyone whose faith is in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and he indwells us. He is with us. He's with you. Next, we see here in the text that we are to be faithful in the midst of persecution and betrayal. We are to be faithful in the midst of persecution and betrayal. In verse 9, Jesus starts talking about a different tribu uh, tribulation that, that will be in this age. And he tells his followers, be on guard. Why? For they will deliver you over to councils. And you will be beaten in synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. He's letting his disciples know that just as he's being turned over to authorities and he's going to be punished and beaten and eventually killed, the same will happen to his disciples. He's given them the heads up. And, and not only that, not only will his people be persecuted, but notice what he goes on to say, that, that his followers will be betrayed by those they love most, by those who are closest to them. Brothers will deliver brothers to be killed. Fathers will hand over their children. Children will rise up against their fathers and have them killed. This sounds harsh, doesn't it? This, I mean, this is raw. This is, this is heavy. And, and, and for most of us, the reality is this is very foreign to us. I believe this verse is one reason why people, when they look at this passage, they think, oh, that must be referring to something that happened in the past. Or this must be referring to something that's going to happen in the future. Because I've never seen anything like this. And, and here's the thing. This did happen in the past. If you've never read about the history of the church, during the reign of Nero, Christians were persecuted. And brothers and sisters, it was brutal. Christians were burned alive just so they can be lamps for Nero's garden. Christians were fed to animals just for public entertainment. Believers were sawn in half because of their faith in Christ. It was brutal persecution, but, but here's the thing. It hasn't stopped. 
It hasn't stopped. So many people think this must be referring to something in the future, but the reality is it's because you most likely have lived your whole life in the Western world. But the reality is we have brothers and sisters around the world right now who are suffering persecution, who are dying for their faith, who are being tortured and killed and thrown into prison. It's no secret. You can look this up from the year 1900 to the year 2000. More Christians were killed for their faith in that 100-year span than all of the 1900 years beforehand. Look it up for yourselves. That many believers have been killed in just the last century. Listen to these statistics. This is from Open Doors Ministry. You, you see it on their website. This is from just the year 2020. Over 260 million Christians live in places where they experience high levels of persecution. 2,983 Christians were killed for their faith. 9,488 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked. And 3,711 Christians were detained without a trial. They were sentenced and arrested and imprisoned without trial. And I'll be honest, these numbers sound low to me. These are only the things that were, were able to be calculated. There's more that we don't know about. And so when I say things like, we are blessed to gather here and worship, brothers and sisters, I mean it. And I hope you understand and I hope you have a greater appreciation for it because we have family in Christ around the world right now who cannot do this safely. They must do this in hiding because persecution is still going on. And Jesus tells us, we see in his word, that it will continue to happen for the rest of this age until our Savior returns. Persecution, betrayal. We will keep seeing this. We will keep seeing it. Now, how do we remain faithful in the midst of that? What does faithfulness look like in the midst of persecution? Well, I think we see it in verse 10. In verse 10, we see, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. If you were to read verse 9, skip verse 10, and go straight to verse 11, it would read perfectly. It would make perfect sense. It's almost like Mark just kind of shoved it in there. There was, there was something and he spread it out and he put it in verse 10. I think Mark did that because he knew what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. And so Mark is actually showing us what Jesus was teaching even in the structure of the passage. What I believe Jesus is doing here and what Mark is trying to show us, what Jesus taught is that in the midst of persecution, even though Christians will be arrested and turned over to the authorities, and even while Christians are being betrayed by family, in the midst of all of it, the gospel will be proclaimed. Nothing will stop the proclamation of the gospel. It will go forth to all nations. Nothing can stop it. This is what I believe Jesus was teaching. And if you notice, it even seems like he's saying that he will use persecution to spread the gospel. Notice in verse 9, what does he say? That this is going to happen what? For his sake. It's going to happen for his sake. And so that, that all believers and disciples can what? So that they can testify. So that they can be witnesses in front of kings and rulers and governors. So he's saying, it, it seems to me, he's saying that not only in the midst of persecution, but we will even use, I will use persecution to make, for, make sure that the gospel goes forth to the nations. And guess what? If you know your Bible, what do we see in the book of Acts? Exactly that. Matthew chapter 28 the Great Commission, Jesus told his disciples, go forth and, and make disciples. Go to the nations. Go. And then in the beginning of Acts, we see it again, Acts chapter 1. Go and make disciples. Go. Be on your way. And instead, no one moves. They all just stay in Jerusalem, kicking in Jerusalem. No one leaves. And we see the beginnings of this fulfilled because in Acts chapter 4, it says Peter and John, they were arrested and they were standing before the, the rulers of the synagogue and, and they were very impressed by them because they knew these were men without education and yet they answered with wisdom. 
That is the fulfillment, I believe, or the, the first fulfillment. There are many more throughout history of what Jesus said in verse 11. Do not be anxious. When you stand before others, when you stand in the trials and synagogues, don't be anxious. The Spirit will tell you what to say. We see that happening in Acts. But even so, they didn't leave Jerusalem. What got them out of there? Persecution. Persecution. In Acts chapter uh, uh, 7, we see it, that the church is persecuted and they flee. They run from Jerusalem. But what do the Christians take with them? The gospel. They take the gospel. And everywhere they go, churches start popping up. It's the beginning of church planning. The Lord used persecution to move his people and to make sure that the gospel goes forth to the nations. And so wherever Christians go, wherever we are, the truth of the gospel goes with us. That's the case because we understand that Christ is Lord of all. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And wherever we are, we understand that it is our calling to proclaim that message. It is our calling, it is our duty, our responsibility. Indeed, it is our blessing to proclaim that He is Lord, that He is Christ, and, and that we can only find salvation in Him. This is what we proclaim, that Jesus, He came and He lived a life without sin. He lived a perfect life. He never sinned. He never broke the law of the Father. He never broke any commandments. He sinned. He, he obeyed perfectly, and yet being without sin, He died on the cross, not for His own sin, not for His mistakes. He didn't have any but for the sin of everyone who trusts in him. If you believe that Jesus died for your sin, that he suffered the wrath of the Father so that you don't have to, you can be saved. If you believe that, if you believe that he rose from the grave, he's not dead. We do not have a Savior that is dead. We have a Savior who lives. He is at the right hand of the Father reigning and he will return. If you believe that message that he lived and died and was raised for you, today you can be saved. That is our message. That is what we proclaim. And so we, brothers and sisters, we remain faithful to the Lord by no matter the persecution, no matter who hates us, no matter what our family says, no matter what our coworkers say, it doesn't matter. The way we remain faithful in the midst of it is by persevering in our faith and continuing to proclaim the good news of Christ. Again, no matter the cost to us, there's a reason that Tertullian and a church father once said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Why is that? It's because whenever Christians are persecuted, and even though they're being threatened with death, when they stand firm, when they refuse to renounce Christ, but they stand firm their, for their faith, and they die for their faith, what ended up happening was the people who saw it would come to faith. As people witnessed their faithfulness, they were moved, and, and they believed themselves. And so it was like killing one, and 20 more were born. The Lord uses our faithfulness, not just for our own good, brothers and sisters, but He uses so that others can know He is real, and that He is alive, and that He still saves people. And so let us call on the Lord and ask Him to help us be faithful. My prayer, my desire for Grace Baptist Church is that we do not wait until persecution to be faithful. It may happen. I don't know. And if it does, well, guess what? The Lord told us it was going to happen. He told us it was going to happen. But my prayer is that we don't wait for that. That even now, we would be a people who pray and ask God for passion to share what Christ has done for us. Let us proclaim it freely while we can proclaim it freely. Lord willing, we'll look at the rest of the chapter next week. But as we close, I just want to make sure we remember our ability to persevere in the faith isn't within ourselves. We can't save ourselves and neither do we preserve ourselves. We persevere because of who our faith is in. 
This is why the gospel isn't just something you believe once to become a Christian and then you never worry about it. No, the gospel is something that we cling to each and every day. This is why we must read the word of God and stay in it so that when things like this happen, we are reminded that our Savior told us, don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. I told you this was coming. Stay faithful. Instead of losing heart and panicking or becoming discouraged, let us stop and remember that he said it would happen and therefore we can trust him and we can continue to be faithful. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, once more we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that the seeds that were planted would bear fruit in the heart of all those present, Lord, and, and that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that you would save them, and those of us that do know you, Lord, that you would build us up in our faith. I know we all here, all of your people here, desire to be faithful. Would you empower us to do so? Would you help us to live our lives in light of eternity? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.